Hello, my name is Stephen Ashby, and I'm the director of the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. It's my pleasure to be here today, part of the Energy Exchange 2021 conference. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'd like to tell you a little bit about what PNNL and the other national laboratories are doing in the areas of understanding climate change and how we can decarbonize our energy system. As you know, DOE operates a system of 17 national laboratories that tackle some of the most challenging scientific and technological problems facing our nation and the world. In this presentation, I'll talk about what we're doing in the area of climate science and decarbonization. And I will, of course, talk about the lab I know best, which is PNNL. But the examples I give today really are indicative and illustrative of the capabilities of the entire system and what we're doing to tackle this big challenge. For those who don't know, PNNL is one of the 10 laboratories stewarded by the Office of Science. At our heart, we're all about scientific discovery, trying to understand the world around us, including our planet and climate change. We also do a lot of work in advancing sustainable energy and enhancing national security. Now, these are broad areas. When you look a little bit closer to each of these, what you can see is that we're bringing some fundamental and distinguishing strengths in chemistry, earth science, data science, and biology to bear on a host of the prob uh, problems that we're looking at, including those in decarbonization and energy storage. What I'd like to do here is focus on those topics in the remainder of the time we have. Let's begin with what we and other labs are doing to help us understand climate change. We know the planet is warming. The question is, what does that mean and what can we do about it? Things we need to do, of course, is collect data. We need that data in order to help us develop better physical models for the Earth system, and then to put those models into sophisticated computer codes that we can use to study different scenarios. One of the ways in which we're collecting this needed data is through a user facility operated by the Office of Science called ARM, the Atmospheric Radiation Measurement Facility. It has a variety of mobile and fixed sites. What you see in the picture here is one of those sites in the Azores. In this particular case, you're seeing a variety of uh, radar instruments collecting a lot of atmospheric data. The sphere, for example, is collecting uh, radar data on precipitation rates. We use this information to help us understand better the physical processes what's going on in the atmosphere, how particulate matters can interact with clouds, and what that means in terms of, of the climate. We take this knowledge and then we embed it in very sophisticated computer models. Uh, here, example is E3SM, the Energy Exascale Earth System Model, something DOE is uh, funding a number of labs to develop, uh, working on that, and then we take this sophisticated model and we run it on the fastest computers on the planet, including the exascale platforms at Oak Ridge and Argonne National Laboratories. And here we can then study a variety of scenarios. And what you're seeing in this simulation is the evolution of severe storms, which we know with global warming are happening with greater frequency and have greater intensity. So that's just one example of how we use that data to create new models, to run simulations, that it give us insight into the uh, climate that we have on planet Earth. We can also use this to study various impacts and what it means to us as humans on this planet. So for example, in one recent study, PNNL scientists looked at the impact of warmer coastal sea surface temperatures on mountain snowpacks. Here you can see uh, a picture of the Western US. And what you can see here is the uh, the Cascades and the Sierra Nevada. And what our study showed is that although the coastal waters are warming along the entire coast because of something called atmospheric rivers, that warming manifests itself in different ways. In particular, it means less snowpack in the Cascades, more snowpack in the Sierra Nevada. Profound implications for water resource management. So this is how we're using some of our scientific knowledge to really help us understand what we need to do in the face of climate change. Now, as we continue with those studies, we're also looking at what we can do 
to mitigate climate change and global warming. And that's where we're focused on decarbonizing our energy system. And this is really an all in effort by all the national laboratories at the Secretary's behest. The thing we're working on is how we can develop and deploy renewable biofuels to displace fossil fuels that we use in our cars, our buildings, our factories, and a variety of uses. And we're looking at how we can take different types of biomass, for example, food scraps. Uh, we've done this in demonstration projects at a local military base and a local prison. And we're able to show that we can take that biomass, those food scraps, instead of sending it to a landfill, we can convert it into an infrastructure ready biofuel and take advantage of it. This is an example of where we're bringing our chemistry and biology expertise to bear on a real problem. Now, we don't like to just stop in the laboratory. We like to work with others to deploy our capabilities out in the real world. And this slide shows an example of that. It was another example of a biofuel. In this case, taken from carbon monoxide from a, few, from a steel plant. And here, working with Lanzatech, we show we could create a biofuel that was approved by the FAA for commercial use. And in fact, a flight was flown from Orlando to London not too long ago using the TNNL Lanzatech biofuel. So this is a great example of going from basic chemistry all the way to deployment uh, through commercial partnerships. We're also looking at how we can sustainably exploit our marine and coastal ecosystems, which are so important to the planet. Uh, in particular, we're looking at how do we best design and deploy offshore wind turbines. What you're seeing here is a highly instrumented buoy, uh, one of several that we've deployed, first off the East Coast and now off the West Coast. And what we're doing here is collecting data. And it's getting realistic data that will inform decision-making about where we might deploy wind farms offshore. Other instruments, gather information about wave energy and tidal energy that we can use uh, to create marine or systems. So this is an example we're doing uh, in the coastal region. Now, renewable energy is energy storage. Renewable energies are intermittent. What we need to do is have the storage solutions allow us to store it and then use it when and where we want it. And at PNNL and other labs, we can cross a range of energy storage applications, from materials and chemistries for the batteries that power your consumer electronics, to ending range anxiety in your electric vehicles, through our leadership with others in the DOE Battery 500 Consortium funded by EERE, to what we're looking at for grid scale energy storage solutions uh, funded by OE and soon to be home housed at the new grid storage launch pad that will break ground on at PNNL next year. And that is an example, again, of what we're doing to take things out of the laboratory and into the real world. And here, what you're seeing is one of our grid scale storage solutions, a flow battery that has been coupled to a solar array. And this is a real partnership with Energy Northwest and Tucci Energy uh, and one of our local unions to do this right here in Richland. And it's the first demonstration of such a project within the state of Washington, coupled to training opportunities for solar and battery technicians. And it is delivering electricity to consumers in Richland today. So another example of going from technology envisioned in the lab, proven, and then deployed. Part of how we bring all this together is what we're doing to modernize the electric grid. It's really how we deliver that electricity, which will be clean because of our efforts in renewable energy and energy storage, and get that out to consumers. The grid has been called one of the greatest engineering feats of mankind, but it is over 100 years old. It served us remarkably well, but we're asking it to do things for which it was not originally designed. We're asking it to incorporate those renewables, to operate closer to design margin, and to allow for two-way communication with the loads on the grid, say the buildings and the, uh, the loads within it, say HVAC units. And so PNNL along with NREL are leading a 13 lab grid modernization consortium focused on what we're doing to modernize that grid. 
at PNL, one of the things we're looking at is how we can improve grid operations, reliability, and security. And here you're seeing one of two fully functional control rooms in the Electricity Infrastructure Operations Center at PNNL. And it's a variety of tools that we're developing that we bring industrial partners in, we bring power operators in to explore the utility of these tools for their uh, particular uh, needs. The best ones then are licensed to the vendors that support the utilities. And several of these tools have been deployed and are saving hundreds of millions of dollars for the utilities and their ratepayers. One of the new tools that's under development is something called NARM, the North American Energy Resiliency Model. We and several other labs have developed this to improve planning and resiliency. We're now adapting it to do planning related to transmission. In particular, how do we get that renewable energy from where it's generated to where it's needed through transmission planning? So this is an example of what we're doing within the EIOC. We're also looking how we hit, pick that smart grid and we connect smart buildings to it. And a key technology we've developed here is something called Voltron. It's an open source platform, uh, smaller than a deck of cards that can be used to retrofit existing buildings and their HVAC systems, for example, with a little bit of AI, some sensor technology to allow two-way communication with the grid. And in doing so, we've shown that we can reduce HVAC energy use by about 50% or remarkable energy savings. And so we're deploying this, doing additional studies uh, in a variety of places. One of those, another example of deploying our technology is our work in an effort led by Avista and McKinstry in the Spokane Eco District. And here, what they did is deployed a number of these technologies, including Voltron from PNNL, to create the smartest five blocks in the world, showing how we really can bring all this advanced technology to, to address the uh, emissions challenge that we face uh, on the planet. And so we're very proud to be part of that project. And we take all these capabilities and put them to use on our own campus. And this is part of our commitment to sustainability and net zero emissions. And so let me close with a few words on that effort. We've had a long-standing sustainability program at PNNL that's been highly successful and award-winning uh, award in many cases. Uh, here, we're committed to reducing our energy and water usage. One of the things that we realize is we need to understand that and monitor it. That's where technologies like Voltron come into play. And here, we've deployed, uh, deployed Voltron technology to 16 buildings, and that's 10,000 sensors collecting 14 million data points every single day. We apply some data analytics and machine learning techniques to that. And we do that in our building operation control room. Where here you can see it. You can see different capabilities. We're monitoring and controlling building operations at PNNL. And this allows us to reduce our energy and water usage by up to 20%. And so we look forward to additional results there. And one of the things we're working on is testing a new uh, FEMP ability on assessing water and energy resilience at sites. It's called a technical resilience navigator. And we're the first pilot site at PNNL. We're evaluating this tool that we've developed with NREL, exploring it, and then we look forward to working with others to deploy it and use it uh, on additional sites throughout DOE uh, and other federal assets, such as in the DOD. So stay tuned, a lot more coming about the TRN. Another example we're doing at PNNL is as we do new construction, we look at it, we can develop new technologies and deploy them to reduce emissions. In this case, we have a new $90 million energy sciences capability project that's about to be dedicated in just a few months. A key component of this is a heat transfer building shown here. And it allows us to take waste heat from our supercomputing center and use that to warm nearby buildings. A great example of what we're doing to reduce energy usage and the associated emissions. And this is just one example of what we're doing to strive for net zero emissions on our own campus, in which we're looking to reduce our energy usage 
and replace fossil fuels with low or no carbon alternatives, such as electrifying our heating within our buildings, replacing natural gas fired boilers with electric boilers, knowing that we're gonna have clean electricity coming into those uh, boilers in the not too distant future. We are of course also committed to doing this with resiliency because we have to keep those important operations going 24 seven. And finally, what we're doing to demonstrate the power of our own research to tackle thorny issues, such as future of gases from our scientific instruments and other things to really demonstrate those on the PNL campus. And this is just one way in which we're showcasing PNNL as a living laboratory where all these technologies can be proven and then put to good use to meet the president's ambitious goals around net zero emissions. And I think it's just one example of what we can do when we work together to create a sustainable future, not just for our own facilities within DOE, but across the nation and the world uh, for ourselves and for our children. So I want to thank you very much for this opportunity to share a little bit about what PNNL and the other DOE national laboratories are doing to understand climate change and how we're decarbonizing our energy system. Thank you very much.